Thank you. Yeah, do expect miracles. That was uh, good news. Good news. I had a great day yesterday. Um, spent some of the time on the floor just down where Ian sat. Now that was fun. And uh, Marcus got a great prophetic word. And uh, so looking forward to the men's breakfast next Saturday. Uh, let's see how that works out. But all good stuff. Ah. What did you say? <laughs> Mind your language. Okay, so we're doing a couple of, uh, well, three uh, talks from the book of James and, and trying to divide it into three manageable chunks. Uh, as you've been reading James, I hope you've had a look at it, uh, you'll see that there's lots of character traits and the main one that James is encouraging us to go for is, is wisdom. Ask for wisdom, he says, in chapter 1, verse 5. And then in chapter 3, 17, he talks about what that might look like. Wisdom is, first of all, pure, he says, then peace-loving and a few other things there. And the, another theme in, in James is money and wealth and riches. We talked about that a few weeks ago in another series, so we're not going to do that again. Uh, but another theme in James is, is your language, your tongue. And so I thought this morning we would try and look at the book of James and pick out some of the things that James says about the use of our tongue. Phrases like, watch your language. What did you say? And then my grandma's favorite, which was, don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> it smells a funny color. Uh, the, the, yeah, very strange. Anyway, the... The truth that words become actions, and actions become habits, and habits become character, and character becomes destiny. Uh, we, we know the something of the importance of words, don't we? And James has already told us, uh, I say already, if we're going to be looking at James chapter 3, James has already told us that it's good to be quick to listen and slow to speak. I was told that I have two ears and one mouth. And therefore, I need to be talking twice as much as I listen. Uh, but apparently, that's not how it works. James says, uh, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Because often, when we speak quickly, it's because of the anger uh, that's in our hearts. That's chapter 1, verse 19. He told us in 126 to keep a tight rein on our tongue. I wanted to illustrate that with a picture, but I thought that was probably a bit unpleasant, uh, so we wouldn't do that. But James tells us, keep a tight rein on your tongue. He tells us some of the good things that we can say, particularly to ask for wisdom, uh, which we talked about last week. What a great use of your mouth, of your vocal cords. Lord, help me. I need to know what to do. Lord, you've said that you will give wisdom to all who ask, and I'm asking. Lord, you say you'll give wisdom generously. I pray, Please, Lord God, I need a generous helping of wisdom. Lord, you say that you will give wisdom without finding fault, and I know I've messed up and got myself into this situation, but please, Lord God, won't you give me wisdom? That's a great use of the tongue, according to James in chapter 1, verse 5. But there's some bad things we can say. And in chapter 1, verse 13, he talks about blaming God. He says, don't say God's tempting you. It's, it's your, your evil desires inside. It's, it's the the devil that's that's who to blame don't say oh you, you can have a good seat you're important you 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 come in have a seat you you stand over there you you sit on the floor James says don't use your tongue to insult the poor in chapter 2 verse 3 don't use your tongue to dis to, in discrimination chapter 2 verse 16 he says don't say, go, I wish you well, be well fed, uh, keep warm, without doing anything. Don't use your mouth to give false hope or false comfort or as an excuse for not actually helping out. It says, don't, don't say, I've got good deeds and you've got good faith. There, there's no division between those things. We're not in a faith camp and a doing camp. We're not in a social action group and a worship group. We belong together. This is working things out together so that we don't divide things and people and form camps and cliques and separation by using your tongue to label people when folk belong together in the kingdom of God. 
And blaming God and discrimination and empty words and division are just four of the negative ways that we can use our tongue uh, so far in James. Later on, he'll talk about discrimination. Sorry, he'll talk about judgmentalism. Who are you to judge, he says in chapter 4, verse 12. Who are you to judge? The Talmud uh, says that there's a disparaging speech kills three people. It kills the person who says it. It kills the person who hears it. And it kills the person who it's about. James warns us about presumptuous boasting, about bragging in chapter 4, verse 16. He warns us in chapter 5, verse 9 about about grumbling and moaning. It's very easy to do that, isn't it? It's very easy to change the whole atmosphere in a room just by one moan, one negative, one grumble, one... And James says, no, we don't want to be like that. And in summary, he quotes Jesus and he, let your yes be yes and your no be no. There's a, it's difficult, isn't it? To make a commitment to yes and to keep it. I feel that most of my life I've been tempted by the whole FOMO thing, where you never quite want to say yes to anything in case something better comes along. FOMO's fear of missing out. So you never say yes, just in case something better comes along. And I'm trying to develop JOMO, which is the joy of missing out. <laughs> which is the idea that the rest of the world can just get on with it. <laughs> and I'm going to try and make my yes be yes, and my no be no, and realize the beauty of... Um, Listening, the joy of disconnection, the joy of letting go, the joy of not having to be there, the joy of saying yes and sticking to it. But the main teaching on our tongue uh, comes in chapter 3. There is a bit actually in, in chapter 2 verse 12 that's worth looking at. It says, we're told to speak as those who are to be judged by the law that brings freedom. And I, I think the law that brings freedom is to love God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind because that's perfect freedom. To love your neighbor as yourself because that's a law that brings freedom for us and for them. And, and James says, use your words and your actions as those who are living to that. Living up to that perfect law. And then in chapter 3. He gets to his main bit. I think that James, quite a lot of James, is it's sort of sermon notes. It's, it's uh, bullet points. It's highlights. It's things that uh, James wants to remind his, hearers, his readers of because they've already heard it. And so he's got four things that he, uh, four sections, I think, in this little talk. And they don't really flow onto each other. There's not really a logical project, uh, progression like there is in Paul where he's arguing a point and building up to a climax. James just throws four things out there. And I think James would explain those four things if it was speaking to you. So I'm going to try and do some of that now. And he starts with, with grace. He says, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect. We all stumble in many ways. And that's really helpful, isn't it? Because when I look around the room, I think, yeah, we've all messed up in this I've messed up in this the worst one recently was now you're interested aren't you <laughs> I have this habit of um, trying to wind up cold callers I don't know do you enjoy that <laughs> so when someone rings up and says oh, we're just working with some charities in your area my line is which ones and then, of course, that's, that's really funny because then they're panicking. And, uh, and uh, we're working with some charities and churches in your area. Okay, which ones? And uh, then shuffle, 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 look, look, click, click, click. And uh, uh, Colchester City Church. Now, I don't know every church in Colchester, but I think I know every church has got a building in Colchester. And I also know there's no such thing as City Church. So I laid into this guy. And 
And it was quite funny, I have to say. It was quite, because, you know, you sort of start to say that if, if I'm going to buy my electricity from someone, I want them to be reliable, honest, trustworthy and true. And you can imagine I just went for it. And really, I'm a bit ashamed of it, because it was just too far. We all stumble in many ways. And I thought, this poor guy, he's only trying to do his job, isn't he? And God sort of convicted me a bit about it. And um, so I'm trying to be much kinder to cold callers. <laughs> and if you've got a job in a... If you've got a job in a call centre, then hopefully it won't be fearfully... Kingsland Church, I'm not sure... <laughs> No, I messed up. It was bad. It was wrong. I shouldn't have called him a liar and a cheat and a charlatan. No, I didn't. I'm trying to be open and honest here, and you're just laughing. <laughs> we all stumble, don't we? We all get it wrong. We all go too far. We all push it too far. We all say things we regret. We all say things that... That we just can't get back again. And James is very honest about that, very open about that, very real about that. And, and it's something that we, we share. So I think James would say, this is important for all of us. This is something that however long we've been a Christian, however well we have trained our mind and our tongue, there's always things that... So with it, let's, let's keep going for more. And then he says this little phrase, if you're never at fault in what you say, you're perfect. And, and I, I don't know what James would have said at that point, but I think he might have said, actually, my brother Jesus, he was perfect. And he's the standard to whom we're trying to live up to. That's the model that we're going for. That's the, the, the example that we're following. That's, let's, let's recognize that 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 we can improve in this area. Let's, let's see if we can be more like Jesus. And I also wonder if he'd have said something around the teaching of Paul on this whole thing about perfection, because Paul says, you are perfect. You have been made new. That You have been washed, redeemed. You're a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. That you, have, you are blameless. You are pure. You are righteous. You are holy. And, J- and James, I wonder if at this point, James might have in his sermon talked about what Paul says about you being made righteous, made perfect. And the challenge to... Oh, not that one. That's a different challenge. The challenge to be who you are. To be someone who lives up to the truth that Christ is in you. Who lives up to the truth that Jesus has made you new. Who lives up to the truth that you are forgiven and pure and free and holy and righteous. And and I think James would have said, we've all messed up in this area, but come on, folks. We're not like that anymore. That we're a new creation. We can change. We can be different. Because Christ has done something in our lives that's brought a perfection and a holiness and a righteousness to us. And of course there's grace because we know we've all gone wrong. Genuine non-judgmental instruction that says we've all fallen at this point. That we've all messed up. But come on, we can be better. We can be better than this because we are better than this. There's a prod here. If you can control your tongue, you're perfect. But we know we've been made perfect. Let's live up to who we are. Perfect, clean, pure. The flow of the water of life coming out of us. And for James, of course, it was what came out of our mouth. But but for us, it's uh, it's a bit more complicated, isn't it? It's not just what we say. It's what we post, it's what we message, it's it's what we email, it's so much more potential for for good, it's what we tweet, it's so much more potential for damage. But there's grace. I don't know what we'll do at the end of this sermon, I think I might call a few folk forward for for prayer. and, And you're not admitting anything when you come forward and say, I need help with how I use my tongue. Because we all need help with how we use 
our time. And the next part of, uh, so, so the first part's grace, and the next part of the sermon is, is all about, well, two illustrations. And the first illustration is a, a large ship and a small rudder. And the second illustration is a, a powerful horse and a small bit that goes in the mouth of the horse. And, and James says that the big ship is guided by the small rudder, that the powerful horse is guided by the small bit in its mouth. And I... He sort of follows it up with a quote about the whole course of your life is set by the tongue. What you say defines you. What you say defines your character. How you speak defines who you are. You are an encourager to the extent that you use your words to encourage people. You are a prophet to the extent that you use your words prophetically. You are a A lover to the extent that you use your words to love people. You're a carer to the extent that you use your words to care for people. Your character is defined by your words. You're an evangelist to the extent that you use your words to invite people into the kingdom of heaven. Your words define your character. Now, of course, it's not the only thing. It needs to be backed up by actions. Um, We know that words are uh, mere words are are not enough, but somehow our words define who we become. Our words define our character. Our words reveal our heart. Jesus said, didn't he? Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your words define your character. Your words define your destiny. The ship is steered, the horse is guided. Your tongue not only shapes your character, but shapes your destiny. The world is full of self-fulfilling prophecies. I believe very strongly that the Lord God Almighty has set up the world in such a way that he has given us lots of authority, lots of choice, lots of opportunity, lots of delegated um, authority and autonomy. That he doesn't control everything, but allows us to out of our free choice, out of our decisions, out of our commitment to him or to others, out of our selfish desires to make a difference in the world. Just that's how it is. God gives us that authority, that opportunity, that delegated responsibility. That's just how it is. Another thing that's just how it is, is that God has given us our mouths to make such a difference in the way that we use that authority, that autonomy, those choices. That God has made our words powerful. And I think it happens right back in Genesis chapter 1 when God said, and worlds came into being. God said, and the sea and the land were separated. God said, and creation happened. And so it's not a great surprise that when Jesus is born... John calls him the Word made flesh. Because God has set the whole thing up so that words are important. It's not a surprise that many of us call the Scriptures the Word of God. Because the Word of Scripture is powerful. The Word of God is powerful. And so God has set up this world with and giving human beings so much authority and autonomy. And God has set up the world so that what is spoken has such power and it has power to shape your future, has power to shape your destiny. So we can bring creative prophecies where we speak it so that it comes into being. We can bring curses and criticism. We can bring encouragement. We can bring gossip. We can bring a good future. Of course, our words are not the only thing that define our future. You know, you might have to pass a few exams as well. You might have to do a few things. You might have to work a bit harder. But words are vital in shaping our future. And there are spiritual laws and physical laws, aren't there? 
And this law that God has built into the universe that somehow our words are important, it's a spiritual law. Some physical laws happen anyway. Most physical, well, all physical laws, I think, happen anyway. Things always fall downwards. E equals, oh, we've done that one. Uh, e equals mc squared and uh, lots of other physical laws. They, they're true whether we engage with them or not. But spiritual laws, often we need to engage with. We often need to connect with them in order to, to see the benefit of these spiritual laws. And some of them happen anyway, but, but we can leverage these spiritual laws, these promises. Spiritual law, always true. You reap what you sow. Always true. But you can leverage that by making sure you sow so generously. You can leverage that by making sure that you sow into good soil. You can leverage that by making sure that you sow, that's quite a complicated phrase, isn't it? Uh, making sure that you sow regularly. Because then you have a generous, regular harvest. And, and, and that's leveraging that spiritual law that you reap what you sow. If it's a spiritual law that, that your words define your destiny, you can leverage that. You can leverage that by, by speaking positively, by speaking words of health, by speaking words of prosperity and faith, by speaking words of love and compassion, by speaking words of peace and joy, by speaking hope, words of hope and blessing. We can interact with these promises. We can, we can leverage these spiritual laws because our words affect our destiny. So speak well of one another. Speak well of your family. Speak well of your children. Speak well of your mother-in-law. Speak well of each other. Speak well of the group. People will live up or down to your expectations of them and what you speak of them. Speak positively about your work colleagues. Speak positively about your neighbour. Many of you know that we have a church membership system, a partnership. David and Steph talked about it on the uh, the notice sheet, on the notice video, and on uh, we have a partnership system and a partnership covenant that we make. Between between us to say this is how we want to see God's kingdom come uh, through each other uh, based around here and uh, one of the four things that we talk about is unity and and part of that is, as a commitment to protect the unity of our church we say that we will only speak well of one another because we want our community life to be framed by words of love words of generosity words that are positive words that are caring words that see the best in people because our words create a community culture so speak well speak well of people speak well of each other because our words get to frame our destiny together So if point one is all about grace and we've all failed, but let's live up to who we are in Christ. If point two is, is our words are important, our tongue is a small thing, but it's vital because it shapes our character and shapes our destiny. James then, then talks and says that tongue actually can be, can be hellish. It says the tongue is like also a fire, a world of evil. It corrupts, sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. It says the tongue is like a spark that creates a forest fire. He says the tongue is a fire and can be hellish. And Jesus took this further, didn't he? He says if you say to your brother, you fool, then you're in danger of, the, of hell. And, and I don't think Jesus meant at that point that if by one slip of the tongue we call our sibling an idiot, we will forever burn in hell. I don't think he meant that. I think Jesus was talking about the, the way that if we consistently talk people down, 
If we consistently talk of people as foolish, silly, idiotic. If we consistently talk about our brother in that way, we will end up in something that feels a bit like hell. And some of us work in situations like that. Where there's very little respect, there's very little positive language, where there's hardly anything that's said that builds other people up. And everyone's calling each other an idiot, and everyone's recognizing that people are failing, and everyone's accusing people of all sorts of stuff. And some of us work in situations like that, and it feels like hell. And some of us were brought up in families like that, where there was very little encouragement, very little positive that's said. We were always called stupid. We were always called foolish. We were always called idiotic. And it wasn't just our parents. It was our older brothers and sisters as well. And sometimes our aunties and even our grandma. And Jesus says it feels like hell. Because we can do that with our tongue. Because of the hypercritical language and the personal insults and the fiery language and the incendiary words makes living or working there toxic and horrible and hellish. Our words matter. Our tongue is powerful. And there's a phrase that he uses, another point to the sermon really, about the tongue being a restless evil, full of deadly poison. Untamable. All kinds of animals have been tamed, but no human being has contain the tongue it's a restless evil full of deadly poison <laughs> and James's thought here is that it's almost like independent of us that our tongue just wants to say something poisonous our tongue just wants to say something negative our tongue just wants to say something critical our tongue just wants to say something harsh our tongue just wants to say something angry and it's poison and it's dangerous and it needs taming And I I think there's a challenge there. James doesn't really bring it, but I think this is part of the points, you know, the sermon note idea. And I think if he was talking about it, he'd talk about the need to tame our tongue. I think it was the Disney version of Winnie the Pooh, uh, where it says, if you can't say nothing nice, don't say nothing at all. Um, Which is, I'm not quite sure what it means. Um, Well, I know what it means. I'm just not sure it says what it means, but... If you can't say something nice or can't say nothing nice, don't say nothing nice. Think before you speak. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Can you tame your tongue? Can you bite it? Can you zip it? Can you set a guard? Over it. It was uh, David, I think, one of the psalmists, wasn't it, who said that I have set a guard over my mouth that I will not sin against you. I think it was Job who challenged his hearers to say, If you've heard me say stuff, then tell me. If you've heard me say things that have been negative, critical, difficult, then tell me. Because I've set a guard over my mouth. So that's the third point. We all mess up. But can we live up to the perfection that we have in Christ? The tongue is a powerful steering wheel, but we can, we can leverage it for good and create character and destiny. The tongue is untamable, a restless evil, a powerful spark, a hellish flame, but, but can we tame it? And then lastly, he talks about the two sources that influence our tongue. He talks about, it says, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. This should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? And as I said last week, in the book of James, there's often these these two sources that uh, life comes from. 
uh, if you look at the bigger picture of the Bible, you've got one source is the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, the unconditional love of God, where we receive life as a gift and a blessing from God. And the other is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where we decide what's right, we decide what's blessed, we take autonomy for our own actions without recourse to God. We decide uh, that we can judge other people and know what's good and bad about them. And we take that to ourselves and we live off that joy of putting other people down. Or we live off the joy of the tree of life. And James talks about the two sources of life that we can have. And here he says that we can tell by our tongue, by the way that we speak, that there's two things going on. And one is when we use our tongue to encourage and bless, when we use our tongue to worship and praise, when we use our tongue to to love God with all our heart and soul and strength and mind and love our neighbor as ourselves. And another is when we... Use our tongue to curse, to pull down, to gossip, to slander, to boast, to brag, to moan, to criticize. So it's like this comes from salt water and this comes from fresh water. It says, isn't it odd that the same tongue has those two sources? And I don't know what James was would have said when we heard this sermon but I wonder if he would have quoted Jesus when Jesus said on the last and greatest day of the feast John tells us and that's the the day of the feast that they pray for the river that to flow from the temple into the desert is the day is the feast day when the priest comes and pours the jug of water into the ground on the east side of the tem I think it's the east side of the temple to prime the pump for the water of life that Ezekiel said was going to flow and there was going to be life there and the the river was going to be a place for healing of the nations and the tree of life just talked about was going to be in this uh, along this side this river and the the there'd be life and fishermen and prosperity and blessing and there'd be fresh water and teeming fish and in the desert and it was going to be deep enough to swim in not just ankle deep or knee deep or waist deep there'll be deep enough to swim in as the spirit is poured out in the earth And on the last and greatest day of the feast, when they've been praying for this river to start by the temple, Jesus stands up and says in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit. Out of you will flow rivers of living water. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. A fresh spring. Not salty, brackish, empty, dirty, muddy but a fresh spring of living water that brings life. So James says we all mess up. But can we live up to the perfection that there is in Christ? James says there's a powerful steering wheel. But can we leverage those spiritual laws around the tongue to create great character to create a positive destiny James says the tongue is a restless evil full of deadly poison but can we as new creatures in Christ as followers of Jesus tame our tongue and train it for righteousness James says there's two sources a salty spring and a fresh river of water Can we pull on the spirit of Jesus that's bubbling up within us in order to bring life 
through what we say and how we say it. In the name of Christ. Amen. Rob, can you come back and lead us in some worship? And we're going to pray. We're going to pray. Shall we stand together? I just want to pray for you this morning. That God would fill you with his Holy Spirit. So there'd be a river of life that wells up within you. You're very welcome to join me by closing your eyes and sticking your hands out in front of you. And we'll just pray that the Holy Spirit will fill you. That you would have another drink this morning. And as you have another drink, as Jesus said, let him come to me and drink. Whoever's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And out of them will flow a river of living water. Lord God, we pray that you would do that this morning. Thank you for the blessing of the children in the prayer tunnel. Thank you for the refreshing of our worship. Thank you, Lord God, for the, the, the life that's in your word as we've looked at it and, and, and seen it and read it together. Thank you, Lord God. But Father, we pray that there be a river of living water that flows out from within us as we take another drink from heaven this morning. A pure flow of life-giving words that bring hope and joy, that bring peace and comfort, that, that bring blessing, that bring health and prosperity, that are, bring humor. Fill us with your spirit, we pray. We're going to sing together to finish our service. If you want someone to pray for you this morning, then please come down the front over by the cross here. And we'll pray for you. That there be a pure spring of living water that flows up from within you. If you've messed up more than the rest of us, which frankly isn't true, but if you feel you have and you need to know that you're forgiven and clean and righteous and pure then come to the cross this morning and someone will pray for you Lord fill us with your spirit we pray in Jesus name yeah.